thank everyone for coming, and that was actually probably a great lead way into my talk, talking about you know why do we care about lichens, because I'm definitely going to be addressing that in the talk today. So I'm just going to be talking a little bit about um, the advantages of using lichens and um, in restoration and conservation. And firstly, I wanted to um, pay tribute to Dr. David Galloway, who is a, a well-renowned lichenologist in the Southern Hemisphere. And if it wasn't for him, a lot of people would not even be here today in terms of their appreciation and passion for lichens. Um, and he was a huge part of my PhD research, which is me in that tree. Oops, there. Um, <laughs> So um, a little bit of an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm just going to give you a brief synopsis about lichens and the biology of lichens. Talk a little bit about lichen conservation, the advantages of using lichens, and then uh, a snapshot of a couple of findings from my PhD research out in New Zealand on the community composition and the patterns. And transplanting lichens, does it work? Is it possible? And how, how can we move forward with that? And with that, obviously, you guys know by now what, what the definition of a lichen is, and it's a combination of a fungus and an algae. So a microbiome or fungal partner is essential for a lichen to occur, as well as a photobiome or photosynthetic partner. This photosynthetic partner could be either green algae, blue-green algae, or cyanobacteria. Now it has to have both the fungus and the algae, but it can have more than one algal partner, and it could change algal partners throughout its lifespan. Reproduction is both sexual as well as asexual. For sexual, it's the fungus that disperses, and then it relies on the presence of an algal or cyanobacteria to actually form a lichen, versus asexual reproduction, which is, there's propagules, and they, are, they contain actually a photobiont as well as a microbiont. And these occur in the ceridia as well as the cidia and the phallus, which I'll show you a little bit. So the phallus is referred to as this whole entire structure. This whole thing, this whole thing is referred to as a phallus. Now the ceridium, they're these small little structures that are composed of the photobiont cells, and they have appearance of this powdery um, cortex, and it kind of looks warty, cylindrical, scale-like little dots on top of the phallus. Oops. The acidium, um, they also contain both the photobiont and the um, microbiont. And this may be warty. Did I just um, this, this is also another structure that occurs in the phallus for um, reproduction. There's four types of lichen growth forms, and the, the basis of this are the arrangement of the cortical, algal, and medullary tissues, as well as their modes of attachment to the substrate. And the first one we have is a fruticose. It's a three-dimensional lichen, and it's the usneas, and they hang down and they dangle. The folios have a two-dimensional structure, a clear upper and lower surface. The crustose lichens are also two-dimensional, but they are pressed to the substrate, and you can't remove a crustose lichen without removing the substrate as well. And the last is a squamulose lichen, and that is in between a folios and crustose. So lichens can occur on various substrates, including tree bark, rocks, leaves, soil, as well as on animals. Obviously, from the pictures we've seen so far, it's beautiful pictures, they occur in various colors and sizes, from blacks and browns and yellows. And they can actually change colors based on whether they're wet or dry, and also where they are in the canopy or into the, into the landscape based on light. And moisture. And they are from two millimeters up to two meters long. So what's so unique about lichens and how are they different from vascular plants? Well one reason is because of poikilohydra, which means that they depend on the atmosphere and water. They don't have a stomata to regulate any exchanges. They're obviously a symbiosis of between a microbiome and photobiome, which I just talked about. And another very unique feature is that they can produce over 700 different chemicals, which are only 8% are um, produced by other fungal as well and other plants. And so they're really unique and our understanding of that started in the early 1900s and we're still not sure exactly what a lot of these functions are, the chemicals that they produce. 
but so far they've been used, as the gentleman in the back was saying, to, to indicate um, environmental pollutions and sulfur dioxide where certain chemicals will be present under certain conditions. So why, why do we care about lichens besides that they're really cool looking and they're really interesting? Well, they actually really are an important component to various ecosystems where they provide a food source and habitat for various wildlife and invertebrates, which I'll talk about in a second. They're also an important nutrient um, collector, distributor, as well as redistributor of nutrients and water inside the canopy of a, of a forest as well as out into the landscape. They're an indicator of air pollution and quality where certain species will be, pre will be present only, only under certain conditions. And they're also an indicator of biodiversity. So because they're able to withstand and occur in such extreme conditions, they're often a lot more diverse than vascular plants. And so sometimes you have ecosystems where you have maybe four vascular plant species and you have over 100 different lichens. So they've been, because of these reasons, they've been used to answer questions about environmental change, sustainable forestry practices where they move um, lichens around and if it's effective and it's sustainable, then they'll, they'll survive, as well as ecosystem health and forest health. So, so far, what's been going on in terms of lichen conservation? Well, it's a fairly relatively new field. Um, it's more recognized at this point in time um, overseas. Uh, the Royal Botanical Garden in Edinburgh, they have a specific program that's designated towards conservation of lichens and understanding their ecology. And in the UK, they started um, recognizing the importance of lichens to list them in, in the early 80s. They listed about 26 different species. And then the IUCN, which um, was first published, the Red List was first published in 1966, which dealt with vascular plants later not until 1996, started to recognize the lichens. So in California, as, you've, um, as previous speakers have demonstrated, you know, our knowledge and our conservation of them is fairly new, and they were first listed on, put on the red list in 1999, and now just in 2005, there was 14 species considered sensitive. Now considering there's over 1,800 species of lichen, um, that is not a good proportion. But I think our we don't really quite understand as um, we're saying the whole distribution and where they occur across the landscapes. So what are some advantages of using lichens in conservation and restoration? They are extremely important to various types of um, invertebrates, including mites and these water bears, which only occur in mosses and lichens. Um, a lot of large mammals and ungulates rely on lichens and various species of them for food. So caribou and great deer, they've been documenting over 26 different species that they eat. Mule deer, black-tailed deer, mountain goat, over 11 species, pronghorn antelope, over five species, elk, moose, bighorn sheep, as well as bison. So all these animals have been, I don't know why it's cute. Um, I've been, <laughs> excuse me. They've all been reported as eating lichens, also small mammals. So there's a northern flying squirrel that's been documented to have over eight species using it, and the red-backed bull, and 23 different small mammals at this point, probably more, are eat lichens or use them to nest. And particularly important as well, um, especially in the conservation eyes, is um, bird species. Over 45 different species of bird use lichens to build their nest, and this um, top Right picture is a blue gray gnat catcher whose the nest is entirely built of some lichens, and as well as some federally listed species as the marble murrelet, which uses lichens to build its nest as well. Other birds are hawks and hummingbirds, vireos, and, and flycatchers. So now I'm just going to take you to a brief snapshot of um, what I did, part, a portion of what I did for my PhD research, which was in New Zealand, um, on the South Island, in a place called Craigieburn, which is in the mountains. And um, I looked at, these are long, they're long-term um, forest plots that were developed by Rob Allen. And what have they been recording over time is, you know, nutrient cycling, distribution, and been doing experiments in these leaf litter, excuse me, 
Um, so what so what they don't know about the scores is that they had no idea about any of the epiphytes. So nothing had been documented in terms of the epiphytic community. So what I was doing is I was trying to look at the community of um, epiphytic species um, in Northophagus forest for tree age, vertical position of the tree, and look at what environmental variables were important for them. So the temperature, humidity, light, bark morphology across different age trees as well as vertical position. And this is just showing that um, there was a difference between the environmental variables between two dish two different ages of trees. Not sure why this keeps jumping. Um, and what I wanted to point out here was, interestingly, is that there's 25-year-old trees as well as 140-year-old trees. And the relative humidity is over 100%. And this early part here is actually in the, in the evening time. So it's getting extremely humid, but it's only humid at nighttime. Excuse me, I'm not sure why we're having some problems here. Is there here. something leaning at, on a key up there? No, I don't see anything. It just keeps jumping. Anyway, I will continue. Um, so uh, across, we did see patterns across um, vertical position of tree as well as different age trees, and there were clear um, patterns based on green algal lichens and cyano lichens. So those green algae and those that fix nitrogen. The ones that are green algae, they're more higher up in the in the canopy as well, and the cyanolichens are down below. And so was, this is just an example of some of the more common species that occur. However, it is a very complex system. But trying to look at these lichens in terms of their growth forms as well as groups in terms of the chemicals will help elucidate some of these patterns that we're seeing in hopes. So we did see some trends in bark morphology, um, the transmitted radiation where the crustus species did not like more light environments, whereas fruticose species did, did prefer more um, light. Tree height was negatively related to crustose species, and diameter were the cyanobacteria lichens preferred to have larger diameter trees. So overall, very briefly, in general, the photobiont versatility patterns we were seeing, there were distinct patterns between green algal lichens as well as those that fix nitrogen, and that su suggests that there's physiological requirements and under particular moisture and light regimes. And secondary metabolites, so I looked, I didn't present any of the results here, but I did look, see some patterns based on what kind of metabolites particular species were producing, and there were patterns based on that as well. So now that we had a little bit of an idea of what's going on in the, 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 the community patterns, I use experimental methods to try and move them around to see if there were limitations on where they could occur. So I did a pilot study which is based on derived methods from Scylla and Bruce McEwen where I glued them onto a tree, I used some fishing wire, and I also tied them onto a mesh net. And I left them there for about four months to see which ones would survive. And based on that, I developed, um, I used this mesh net and I tied phthalate on, directly onto the mesh and then pressed them to the bark so they, <coughs> they actually got that same microenvironment where they occurred. So I transplanted 264 phthalate across different age trees. And in, um, I used two cyanobacteria lichen and they both success, they were successful in terms of they didn't keep falling off and I had about only 8% and 1% missing. The mean growth was 8% over the course of a whole year, which is fairly high considering lichens are often thought to be really slow growing. However, these were folio species in relatively humid conditions. So I was getting the maximum growth was 150. So one question would be important for us is where did it matter where we collected the lichen from? Did it matter if we moved them from young to old versus old to young? And what I did find that there was no significant difference. It didn't matter where I actually collected the lichen from. So there was a vertical position. Um, so it was a species specific, some variation. They're both um, pseudocephalaria species. They're both nitrogen fixers. But just based on this, I did see that um, the vertical position didn't matter for Pseudocephalaria fabulata, but it did matter for Colensi, but only in 140-year-old trees. The stand age was not an influence of 
of growth patterns. So no matter where I moved them, they had a similar growth. And the other influential, influential factor that I looked at to look at growth rate were health of the thallus, the rate of herbivory, and the presence of that target species on that same tree. So in California, how can we apply these transplant studies into conservation and bring them here? Well, I did some garden experiments, which are still ongoing, where I've just been moving some lichens around to see how they survive, and where I've been misting some of them and putting them with direct water, because cyanolichens require direct water contact, whereas algal lichens require mist. So you have a different microclimatic requirements for both. And so far, I've been fairly successful. I don't have a um, quantitative analysis, but my crustus species are a little bit harder to, to grow than the other two. So what are the paths forward? So lichens are an integral component to various ecosystems. And besides just being really cool looking and beautiful and mysterious, they are serving a purpose into a lot of different communities. However, just by just because of our lack of knowledge and not really knowing much about them in terms of their distribution and where they are, it's I think it's important that we actually tie them and emphasize their importance in different keystone, rare, and common species. And if we can incorporate lichens into their management plans as well as conservation restoration, we can have success hopefully in reducing the amount of habitat that's destroyed for, as well for lichens. Um, and it's not easy to grow lichens in pseudo, which is, is knowing you can't take an algae and a fungus and grow it in a lab, it just hasn't worked yet. However, if we understand a little bit better about species under requirements, we can transplant them. And so in coastal sage scrub habitats and oak woodlands where we're destroying them, if we could preserve some of the substrates as well as the lichens that occur there and just move them to the new areas, that might be a path forward. Thank you very much.